If you're a pop culture junkie who loves TV, film, music, comedy, and other really important stuff, then you've come to the right place. Get ready and settle in for Classic Conversations, the best pop culture interviews in the world. That's right, we circled the globe so you don't have to. If you're ready to be the king of the water cooler, then you're ready for Classic Conversations with your host, Jeff Dwoskin. All right, Wendy. Thank you so much for that amazing introduction. You get the show going each and every week, and this week was no exception. Welcome, everybody, to episode 266 of Classic Conversations. As always, I am your host, Jeff Jawaskin. Great to have you back for what's sure to be a classic episode for the ages. Joining me today is none other than comedian Joe Matarese. We're diving in with Joe, talking about his comedy specials, America's Got Talent, and a whole lot more. And that's coming up in just a few seconds. And in these few seconds, Lenny Rips was here last week. Don't miss my conversation with Lenny. Star Wars holiday special, booze and buddies, full house. So many great stories. You're going to love that chat. But right now you're here to love my conversation with Joe Matarese. Quick heads up that there's a lot of adult language in this episode. Nothing gratuitous, but more than usual. So I just wanted to mention it so you can have headphones on if you're at work or with the kids. We're diving into the ups and downs of reality television. Joe's sharing stories, opening for Bill Hicks, hanging with the pre-famous Drew Carey. So much goodness coming up right now. Enjoy. All right, my next comedian. You may have seen him on The Late Show with David Letterman. Five times on The Late Late Show with Craig Kilborn and Craig Ferguson. America's Got Talent, Howard Stern Show, his own Comedy Central special. Fixing Joe, Philly's own Joe Matteries. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> that was hilarious, Jeff. That was, uh, I like that uh, radio voice you turned on for that. That was nice. It's from years of doing stand-up at the club when they would have the good people doing Uh-oh. the intros. <laughs> so I was like, it does sound like that guy who's on the offstage mic yeah, who I, never gets your name right, that guy. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, okay, so speaking of comedy clubs, funny thing. So I'm watching your clips, you know, doing my, my Joe mm-hmm. research, one of your comedy reel, and all of a sudden you're like, this is the worst club ever. And like, that's Joey's Livonia. Oh, I'm forgetting. Yeah, you're in you're in Detroit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's gone, right? It's gone. But I was just like, oh, it's so funny. That's Joey's Comedy Club in Livonia because it's an unmistakable backdrop. And so I was just, <laughs> I just thought that was too funny. <laughs> it's, it's funny. Like I leave that clip up there because it has so many views, and it's a shame because the quality is so bad because it's been on YouTube so long. It was like before anyone had cell phones with hd cameras on them that was like filmed with like like a camcorder in the back so like and i'm too lazy like i have the original little if you look at this closet that's behind me right here all of like every iteration of from vhs to dv to mini dv to vhsc like to quarter inch tapes i even have mini you remember those mini discs? Comedians used to have those little mini disc recorders. They were little squares. You could sit them in the back of the club and they would record really well. I even have mini discs in that back thing. I have that actual clip probably in way better uh, resolution in that back. Oh, I, I have like an entire box because I would film every time I would go on stage. And so I have an Me entire too. box of like those tapes and I had no way to play them. And then I was at a... Um, I was with my daughter at a estate sale and they had this zip drive. Did you have a zip drive where it was like, you know how floppies were like a couple of mag, but a zip drive was like a hundred mag. It was like mind blowing. <laughs> you could put a hundred meg on one piece of digital media. I was like, girls, this is, I lived on these things. I had them. They're the greatest things ever. <laughs> Well, it's fine. My my brother recently texted me some company that, you know, that's their thing, that they'll digitize your old video VHS tapes or whatever, or whatever kind of format you have in it. And I said to my brother, he goes, this, it's pretty affordable. I go, I just checked and it's $13 per videotape. And I go, I might have a thousand. I go, <laughs> pretty sure I'm not paying that. I'm like, and I'm not sorting through this to figure out what would be usable on social media? I'm like, would this real? There's only one thing that I would really want to put up there. I have like ho- a home video of me 
on my first road gig ever, I think it was 1992, I was the MC. It was the Cleveland Improv, and Bill Hicks was the headliner. And I'm filming Bill Hicks at the bar, asking him questions. And it's so cringeworthy because I'm such a new comedian and the stupid shit I'm asking one of the greatest comedians of all time. I would love to put that up on social media because I'd be like, oh, my God. That's amazing. So what what did you ask him that was so cringeworthy? Do you remember one? I assume because it was cringeworthy, you do remember at least one. <laughs> I, I remember one classic piece of information I took from it, and it's funny that I used the word piece. There was a moment, I was such a Bill Hicks fan, and I couldn't believe I was getting to open for him on my first road gig, right? There was something called The Dirtiest Dozen that came out back then, and I, I'm way older than you. You know, I was born in 67, started comedy in 89, not around 89, 90 is when I first started open mic. And I get a chance to go out to Cleveland to do this gig. And the Dirty Dozen came out. It was a pay-per-view. You had to pay for it. And it had like all these comedians like being dirty. And Bill Hicks was on it. And that's where I had first saw him. And he had this bit that I called on my own, Shit the Brood. It was like something about the joke was like, if I can vaguely remember, it was like somehow he hated Dick Clark and Dick Clark gets pregnant from like the seed of John Davidson is like fucking Dick Clark. I can be dirty on your podcast, I'm guessing. Sure. So uh, he's like having anal with Dick Clark and then they have a baby and this person becomes pregnant and starts, as Bill Hicks would say, shitting the brood. And literally in the bit, he's just shitting all these performers that he thinks sucks. And I still remember at one point he, he shits twice and he's like, ugh. Ugh, wham <laughs> so he, he shit twice and called it wham and i had just thought this bit was really funny when he did it <laughs> so i had asked him to do it before he went on stage the first night and he was about halfway through his act and he hadn't done it yet what a cringeworthy moment this is that i did this i got one of the waitresses i wrote down on a bar napkin shit the brood handed it to the waitress and she brought it up to him in the middle of his act she fucking walks up. Typical comedy club waitress has no idea when she should maybe interrupt the comedian. Just walks right up and just shoves him this piece of paper. And he looks at it and he goes, all right. And I'm like, so embarrassed in the back. This is a great piece to add to the uh, story is Drew Carey is sitting next to me. Drew Carey wasn't famous yet. This is how long ago it was. He was the local headliner for one of the nights when bill hicks was doing letterman so like i think drew carey did the tuesday night and then hicks is wednesday through sunday right so drew carey was such a fan of bill hicks he came back when he wasn't working and he's sitting next to me and he goes all right I'll, and he goes into the bit thank god it kills right it gets like a big <laughs> applause break thank god and me and drew carey are high-fiving each other at this bit that's just so disgusting and <laughs> we're loving it so cut to after the show talking to bill hicks i have and it's one of those big camcorders you know from the early 90s sure i, I bought it with a jc penny credit card that they would give anybody credit back then and i had a jc penny credit card and i maxed it with one buy i'm like i'm buying a video camera i'm gonna be able to film all my comedy sets and i stick the camera in his face and just turn it on and the middle, I could still remember this guy's name too. His name was like John McDowell or John McDonough or John McSomething. If he's out there and you, and you get to see this podcast, John, you remember it was you. John's more of a ham than me or Bill Hicks. He just like is going for it in the camera. And all of a sudden, Bill Hicks on camera starts talking about how I ass assaulted him with a request. <laughs> and he goes, and I still remember that this was like a great takeaway for comedians. He goes, I'm in the middle of my Chevette piece. That's what he says into the camera. <laughs> and this guy requests shit the brood. And I'm doing my Chevette piece because the audience is stupid. So I have bits purposely put in my act to keep me doing well for when I want to do the more meaningful material. And I was like, huh. I remember thinking like, huh, even Bill Hicks has some hacky shit that he throws in there. Because I remember he had like, a, this is your brain, this is your brain on drugs bit that I had seen every comedian have. But he had one too, but they were purposely in there. And when he says Chevette piece, the middle act looks into the camera, he goes, note to self, 
He goes, in five years, change from calling them bits to pieces. <laughs> <laughs> and that stuck with me for some reason. I still to this day think comedians, you don't write one-liners, you write pieces of material, pieces, long amounts of material. And it starts to really make sense, especially if you want to make money on Sirius XM, which you can make decent residual money off your comedy albums which I had until this lawsuit, which we could talk about later, that's going on with Sirius XM. I stopped for the last five months. I haven't been getting any residual money. They dropped all seven of my albums out of their library, which sucks because of some lawsuit that a record label started that I didn't start. But yeah, if you have a good piece, that makes you good money on Sir Sir Sirius XM. You know, can't have one joke about something, then move on to another subject. It's, it's tough to air 15 seconds on a radio <laughs> the best advice i ever got from a comedian who was like a good storyteller comedian it wasn't like it was a series of bits that he eventually put together as into a piece as you call into it a so piece. it's sort of like taking the different ones and then that helped me also with memorization because if i knew like this piece just fit into this piece into this piece into that piece then you'd have like this bigger piece you know so it was yeah. like it's also interesting well, to hear like when one of the greats like Bill Hicks still knew how to massage the audience to to get to that. Yeah. And it was also, which is funny, I heard I heard Louis C.K. recently on somebody's podcast saying, he was talking about his opener, this girl, Adrian Iappalucci, who I know pretty well, and she has really dark material. And he was saying, I love watching a comedian that really doesn't belong on stage do well and make it work on stage. He goes, those are what comedians should be. He doesn't think it should be the guys with a lot of charisma. And if you hung around Bill Hicks for a week, like I did, I mean, very quiet off stage, no charisma whatsoever. It's all material. When you have no charisma, you're kind of forced to really write, really write well. I wish I was that. I think I'm I'm a charisma comedian, which I, I wish I wasn't. Some people say, no, you have clever bits. You have both. I'm like, eh. <laughs> I noticed the guys. I'm aware. I don't think I'm nearly as well written as some of the guys with no charisma. <laughs> I could go up there with nothing and get laughs. Good that you have the confidence to do that. Gilbert Gottfried yeah. was very, I worked with him. I got to open for him once and he was very quiet. Back He's another one, silent. I'm told that whole voice was fake. And they used to play his real voice on the Howard Stern show that you would go, that's literally sounds nothing like Gilbert Godfrey, his regular, that he has a whole other voice. I mean, Chris Rock has an inflected voice. It's still his voice, but it definitely is a turned on voice that he uses for when he's in concert. And when you would see him come into the clubs in New York City, where I came up in, and I still live close to New York City, he pop, when he pops in to work on new material, he just does it with no inflection. He just reads it like he doesn't do the none of that. Motherfucker, none of that shit. It's just like, and then this guy, and he just does it flat to see if it works by itself. On stage voice. That's why <laughs> he doesn't do the stage voice. No, I'm saying like stage, that's what yeah. that's what uh, my brother used to always. He'd come watch me do comedy, and he go, "You know who I'd love to be friends with? On stage, Jeff." Uh, that's funny. Uh, that's probably what my wife would probably rather be married to. <laughs> I'm very, uh, uh, what's the word? Like very in the moment. I'm not in my head, as my wife would say. I'm in most of the time when I'm off stage. The best version of me, I always say, is on stage. Especially if I took Adderall about an hour before I went up there. I'm like, oof, 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 oof. but like off Adderall, me in the middle of the day, I'm just like, I think I'm half awake most of the time. <laughs> I'm slow. I want to hear about this lawsuit. They screwed over a lot of comedians and artists, and you kind of got sucked into this. Yeah, it's weird. I'm I'm just starting to unfold information on it, which a lot of comedians probably knew all about it right away. But it's kind of at least it's unfair to me, and I don't even know how much we're allowed to talk about on podcasts. Have you entered any? Have you interviewed any comedians that have brought it up? No, it's first, I mean, I I oh, saw I, your... I saw on, like on Facebook. I thought John Heffron was talking about some of his stuff got removed because of something indirect. What sucks about my situation is I have five albums that weren't on the record label that is having the dispute, and they dropped those too. It's like I'm blacklisted. My name is connected with that record company because I did two albums with them, which I could live with that. Take those off and don't play those, but you're not playing the other five either, so I'm down to zero dollars. And 
that money really came. Thank God this didn't happen during COVID because that money was really important when I had no gigs for, you know, that two year stretch. But it still sucks now because you got used to it. I was getting a nice little residual check every month for seven albums. And most of them were from the latest album I did with that record label, which I won't say their name, but they instructed me and they were smart. I hate this because it's like a friend of mine is a musician. I was just talking to him earlier today and he's like, you never want to do it for the money or you always want to do it for the art. And I'm like, I totally did what they said for the money and it worked, which was record a clean album. They said, I don't care if you do old bits from some of your older albums. If you re-record it, it doesn't matter. If it's clean, there's seven stations on Sirius XM and only one's dirty that plays comedy. And you got six clean ones. So do the math. The more you're played, the more money you get. So my money, the positive was my money went way up. But the negative was they stopped playing any of the old stuff. They just threw them. It was like that didn't exist. You learn a lot about the businesses. Sometimes certain record labels... They have a way of getting their material played. Even back in the day, right? I guess some of the record, they could get your sh they could get your shit on the radio, and that was what you wanted. You want the people to hear it. And nowadays, not only do you want them to hear it, it's your check's bigger if it gets played more. So, like, there's no one ever that's like, I came to the tonight show because I hear you a lot on Sirius XM Comedy Channel. Like, I've maybe had that said to me once. I hear your stuff, but like, for some reason. It doesn't make you a draw. They could play you a ton, but makes you money. And there is, it's difficult as a performer. It's like, how much do you go towards the money without compromise? Well, it's almost like, it sounds like it's more like a passive thing too. Like a pass, almost like a comedian version of passive income. I can see where they yeah. may not know it's Joe Matteris because I'm driving a lot of the time, right? So I'm just your name, kinda, Yeah, your name comes across the screen. It's but, on the yeah. screen, but I'm not, I'm not looking at it and stuff. Maybe you need to do uh, pull a Taylor Swift, just re-record the album, you know, parentheses Joe's version. Well, I was about to say that that's what I just got instructed to do. It's funny that you say that. Someone told me, a few comedians were doing it, and they said, do this, go re-record all your greatest hits and go to a different record label that isn't that record label and have them submit it because we don't take self-submissions anymore. There was a time they would let you self-submit your albums. Not an easy do to go re-record everything that's old. It's not going to cost you a lot to record an album. A musician to go re-record his music, that will cost a lot more money. You know, not that easy to go do it. And the heart's not there sometimes. You're like, I got to go redo that old bit. It doesn't work as well because I don't like it anymore and it's old. It's like, it's not easy to go re-record at all. You can re-record your newer stuff and then resubmit, but it's complicated. One comedian started his own label because of this lawsuit. But he was nice. He's like, I'm going to do it for a low percentage. Because record labels, I don't know if people out there know this, they get 50%. There's two checks, one to the, the label and one to the artist. The lawsuit is that they want the written format to also generate money. How a musician, there's three ends of money. There's the writer, there's the performer, and then there's the label. With comedians, it's just two. That's what the lawsuit is about. So the other option I have is wait it out and get a lawyer and try to really get this written form of what we're doing. And that's confusing to me because like a written form of a script is easy. You can put it, you'd have to write all your jokes out word for word and then get them copyrighted. I mean, that's not tremendously hard to do. And I'm sure comedians would do it if someone was paying us for the copywritten side of the written form, right? I mean, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't understand all of it. Yeah, and music, I think that's where the money is. That's that's where Lionel Richie made all his money and they said, goodbye, Commodores, right? Yeah, and then like what you said, uh, Taylor Swift, what was her reason for re-recording? Did she have a really bad deal or some sort? Somebody or? bought all her music rights, but she owned... Like they own the person who bought her music. I'm I'm gonna get this wrong, but it's one of these things. Like own like the recorded version, but she owned like the music or whatever or the words, like or whatever it was. So she could then legally re-record it. Not every artist would have been able to do that because it's possible they wouldn't have owned either of those. But somehow she had good lawyers up front, so that's how she was able to actually re-record it. Otherwise, they would have owned the the words and the music. Sorry to interrupt. But I have to go fact check everything I just said about Taylor Swift. Uh, before I get letters, I'm pretty sure it's mostly true or accurate. Kind of close. I don't know. 
Anyway, I do want to thank everyone for the support of the sponsors. When you support the sponsors, you're supporting us here at Classic Conversations, and that's how we keep the lights on. And now back to my conversation with Joe Matarese. A little more on this Sirius XM lawsuit. That's the other thing that happens in this business is guys like, I guess some of the big names that are suing are like Lewis Black and some of these other people. I told you what I was making a month. We could imagine what someone like Lewis Black, who's getting played a ton, is they're probably getting $50,000 checks a month in residuals from their audio being played on Sirius XM. You know, like, so they're suing, but someone like that is still a millionaire. So like me losing this smaller amount, what was, who had a joke about that? It was uh, Eddie Murphy, right? Back in like Delirious or something, he has a, where the women want half, women want half. I remember him having a joke about that. He's like, but you get 30 million. I remember him having, or maybe it was Chris Rock. Chris Rock or Eddie Murphy had a joke about that, where it's like the spectrum changes. Like you take this small amount away from me and I don't make it, and I don't make millions of dollars touring. You're really fucking me here. It's like, I'm sitting there going, and, and it's unfair. I'm like, well, I didn't even sue. <laughs> Someone right. else decided to sue. I didn't, even, they didn't even ask me if I cared if they sued. If they would have said, we're going to sue and there's a chance you're going to lose that money, I would have been like, I'm happy with this money. Like you said, it feels like passive income. It feels free. Right. It's un it's unfortunate because like one of the bigger names probably don't miss it. It's just the point for them. You always wonder, it's like, does anyone not miss a certain amount of money? Do you think Lewis Black doesn't miss 50 grand a month that he was getting? It depends. How, it depends how much he makes. Maybe, you know, I, I don't know. It's all relative. It all becomes relative. I remember standing right. next to a billionaire once thinking, my God, this guy's a billionaire and I can't decide if I should buy an iPod. You know, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> yeah, it's all relative. Well, I hope that works out for you. I hope that works out for you. It's been affecting my mood. It's been putting me in a depression, to be honest. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to make some phone calls. Cheer me up. After. Cheer me up. Cheer <laughs> I'm going to make up. some phone calls. Here. I'm going to call you. <laughs> but <laughs> so let's talk about something else. Let's, let's talk. Like, can we talk about America's Got Talent? Is that a good one? Whatever you want to talk about, whatever you want to dissect from my career. I just, I'm more interested in like from America's Got Talent, like what the, um, what actually goes on behind the scenes. You were one of those folks on America's Got Talent that, you know, they did the backstory. Your kids were there. Your wife was there. And it's like, I always wondered like how much goes into like picking who, who and what the stories they tell and, and like how scripted even that dialogue that back and forth with you and Heidi Klum was that kind of thing because she's like are you gonna sing or, and you're like no I'm a stand-up you are like they don't know they're about to see a stand-up <laughs> you know I mean? it's all scripted to put that in we'll put this in perspective and you'll probably agree with this and no matter what you do I'm gonna guess this is in any career I don't know if it's just as a stand-up comedian anything that either helps your career a lot or makes you a lot of money in your career is followed by a lot of work. There's nothing that like will really help your career that was easy, right? Like say like you do a one hour special and it blows up. There is a lot of work into putting a one hour special together, filming it, editing, editing it, the preparation for it to get it as good as it was is a ton. So like America's Got Talent could really help your career, right? And even in those two episodes, that I, that's all I was on is two. And that first one is the one where they did the backstory on my family. It was such a pain in the ass. So much work. So many hours spent. It wasn't like going, like, it wasn't like I showed up that day and it all happened that day. There was so much process to go into just that one episode where my kids run out on stage. I had to go there. Where there's a huge line. Sure, my ma manager at the time set it up so I didn't have to wait in the line, but I had to perform for some woman in a room, just some woman in a room. And then she passed me on to now I have to go perform for the casting people, which is like four or five more people. And that's like four hours later. So like, and I'm sitting in this room for four hours, filling out the contract for just the contract should have been uh, say all how much of a pain in the ass this show is going to be to be on the com I'm not the, I'm not lying it's a hundred pages long you could never sue them for anything which is a, a way of letting you know we can fuck you so bad on this show and there's nothing you can do which they pretty much did in the second episode of me they they edited it in such a way that never happened and added 
all this sound, all these sound effects, like my life was about to end. And none of that happened. None of it. I knew there was so much bullshit in that show. It was so fixed that it was ridiculous. And if you're a stand-up comedian for 20 years, think of every time you did a comedy contest when you were coming up as a comedian. Were they, have you ever been to a fair comedy contest? They're never fair. Someone wins because they brought a lot of friends or someone wins because they know the judge personally. There's so much of that shit. It was unbelievable how much bullshit went on in that show on national television. So it's like they had, it was almost like they had, they picked the person who was going to win before it even happens. The con, the performing has nothing to do with anything. That's what it felt like. I was talking to a comedian who was on Last Comic Standing with Gary Goldman that that episode, that season, she was telling the story how they all had the, their goodbye baskets and everyone had it but Gary, but no winners had been announced. And then they kind of realized, and then they were oh, when they kind of realized that they ended up picking a different winner. But I agree with you. It's like a lot of times it comes down to it's a show, right? I mean, like while it looks like a competition, it's no different really than a scripted show. They're choosing well, you because you fit yeah. a certain mold. My version of what you just said with Gary Goldman was the second episode, they tell us we're going to have to perform for this crowd. And they were building this. They were literally building the audience platforms where all the audience was going to sit. And we had to wait there for like 10 hours. I think we had to come back the next day and wait for 10 more hours. They even filmed some of these magicians. They would film them in groups. Like, here's let's film the 10 magicians. Now we're going to film the comedians, right? There was like, I don't know, eight of us. All of a sudden, we get an announcement. The guy gathers everybody together. He goes, we're not going to film in front of an audience now. We had technical problems, no audience. And then also I noticed, hey, where's Dan Natterman? <laughs> Dan Natterman is a really funny comedian who I'm very good friends with. All of a sudden, he's not involved. And I realize, and he tells me, no, I'm already in the next round. I go, this round's not even over. We didn't even perform yet. You're in the next round, but we didn't even perform yet. So that's when I went, oh, shit, he's white and he's around my age. They're not going to have two white guys in their 40s. So and then I failed and then I, I called them on it. But I think they they edited around that a lot. I went because I've been doing this too long. You gave me a standing ovation and were praising me like I was the next Eddie Murphy on national television. And now you're like this when I walk out, make me laugh and you're not laughing. I'm like, they're trying not to laugh. Like. Why are they mad at me? I just walked out here. Why do they look mad? Not only did they love you, they purposely did the cutback where you could hear their whispers where Howie, Mandel, and, and Howard, and then we're all going, oh my God, oh my God. You know, it was like that first one where with this, in addition to the standing ovation, I mean, they- yeah. And then also, which is such bullshit, I had been on the Howard Stern show. He interviewed me on the Howard Stern show. I used to tour with Artie Lang from the Howard Stern show. How's that not coming up? Why are you at? He's acting like he's never seen me before. Either you're that oblivious that you don't remember who you interviewed, which could happen, but I'm just like, and still giving me the stink eye. I was like, it's almost depresses you because when you watch the good versions, when it's going good and you do hear that whisper, like, oh, he's funny. Oh, this is good. And you're going, they're just told to say that. Like, this is depressing. They don't even think the positive or the negative it sucks. <laughs> But you do. I, I had a friend. I had a friend on America's Got Talent that a local guy that just got eaten alive. Painful. It was painful to watch. Wendy Liebman was on your episode. Yeah, I think in, in the clip, but there's a cutaway to her. Yeah, she was very cool. Like we hung out the whole time. That was she saved me. It felt like detention when you had detention in school, but twelve hours long each time you had to go in. You just sat there for twelve hours. Where you said my wife and kids. My kids were little then, if you watched, you know, that's a long time ago. Do you know how hard it was to keep a little kid occupied for 12 hours in a room? My daughter was like one. That's parents of the year for you right there. <laughs> but, but to compensate, they did have free Subway sandwiches there. I was like, you can't even freaking give us good sandwiches. Subway? Come on, we're in New York. <laughs> Hook us up. The fuck? <laughs> Everyone gets a foot long. All right. It's Come the on. food <laughs> Do you regret then doing it? Or do you feel like you got enough out of it that it was fine? Most people don't even remember that second one anyway. They don't because the, the first one has a lot more views on YouTube. And still to this day, I mean, 
my social media person that I use, I mean, she uses that clip. She uses that clip for uh, for promo all the time. It's a great clip. It's like heartwarming. Like there's a moment where I almost start to cry. Like that was real. Like, and when my kids ran out on stage to have that, like, I'll never have that ever again. It was pretty cool to have your kids that are that little running on stage in front of 2000 people standing up, giving you a standing ovation is it was worth it just for that. It's a great clip. I mean, you crushed it. That had to feel good in itself. Not that you haven't crushed it, I'm sure, a million times, but I mean, it's a different, I'm sure, pressure yeah. pressure zone to go in front of them, in front of all these people, you know you're, you're going to be on TV, and then just kind of nailed it. Well, to be honest, maybe I'm too hard on myself. I'm not really crushing it there. I mean, there's that's a different kind of laugh when you're on a talent show than when you're doing a comedy special or you're doing Letterman and the audience knows a comedian's about to come out. It's a, it's not like I'm killing, but they all like me and I get a standing ovation. But it's still like a the laugh is on a lower level than a normal comedy performance. Your vibe was right on. Though. You know, my I mean, my for, vibe was good. Yeah, I mean, for executing for that type of competition, I'm saying you, you did great. Well, that's what also sucked about the second round is the material I picked that I was going to do for the second round was because we were going to have a crowd. If I would have known no audience, I would have picked different jokes, but that wouldn't have mattered. I was going to lose anyway. It's funny that also that that joke that made me lose, it's a joke where uh, I think I'm trying to remember. I think it is the joke where I say, uh, marry non-American. Can I go? Yeah, I think it's this joke I did about you should marry and not marry non-American. And I tell this quick story of my wife's Brazilian, my wife's uh, cousin who married this Brazilian woman who's nine months pregnant, cooking and cleaning for everybody in this summer rental that we rented. And she's all muscular, like nine months pregnant. And I was like, what the fuck is this? I pulled her aside and I go, how are you, how you doing this? You know, how are you pulling this off? She goes, Joel, in Brazil, we are taught at an early age to be great wives. And I go, like, fuck, right? <laughs> I go, my wife taught me at an early age. I was taught it. Oh, shit, I'm fucking my own punchline. Up. I haven't <laughs> done it in so long. <laughs> I can't even, I was, my wife was taught at an early age to teach her husband how to be a great wife. That's what it was. <laughs> that joke, somewhere I've posted it, it has like, I don't know, 2 million views or something. And it's just so funny that that joke has 2 million views in one place and in another place it got me kicked off a reality <laughs> show. Because that's a joke that in front of an, only a comedian would know this. When you're doing comedy in front of four people and no audience, they got to be quick. I definitely can't fuck it up like I just told you. That would that would make me lose. Like you said, you were, you prepped. There's a certain energy you get from the crowd, right? They feed you. Yeah. When they remove that from you, do they know the material you're going to do? No. No, they don't. They're hearing it for the first time no. also. They can edit like they have the greatest editors I've ever seen. I mean, they zoomed in on my hands and made it look like I was nervous. Like it was unbelievable. And I was not I, I was not nervous. Like I I wasn't nervous, but I thought I'd get a little like, hey, Joe, like when I walked out there, oh, hey, it's Joe, eh, you know, the guy we gave a standing ovation to and said uh, he was mind blowing or I mean, Howard Stern said some stuff that wasn't that didn't make the it's weird. There's two versions of it on YouTube and there's one version where he says something like you were unbelievable and like remark. He goes on and on in this one version. That's the one I use in my demo tape, by the way. I'm sure that well, even Howie was like everything I like in a comic. So it's like, it's disheartening to hear that. I remember, um, was Dan Natterman on Last Comic Standing also? Yeah, yeah. He had that situation yeah. with, where the judges quit because they were they voted for him and then he still didn't make it. Yeah, he's also funny. I agree with you on that earlier. So you're happy. I mean, for as an experience, you wouldn't change it or you would? I guess like my friend Johnny, I have a friend Johnny Lampert who books me on a lot of gigs and he's always like, even if you do a shitty gig, he'll be like, when you're done, you got, you got that money in your pocket and you're driving home. It wasn't that bad, even though it was bad. So like, even though it was bad and it was an insane amount of work, many years later, you don't feel, it's like when women have a kid, this have a second kid, they forget how horrible it was to be pregnant for nine months. And then they do it again. If you told me, Joe, go on America's Got Talent again, I'd probably, even though it sucked, I'd sit there and go, shit, that would be a good backstory. I'm the guy that was on that time and I did good. And now I'm back again and I'm older and I'm an older dad. Oh, what are they going to do? You know, like you sit there and when you've been in this this long, it's like you almost go, I'll try anything to escalate my career as long as they're not going to freaking hurt me physically. 
that would just hurt me mentally and be a, a pain in the ass to sit there for a few days, but I could handle it. All right. And so prior to this, you had a Comedy Central Presents special. You've had, you have two specials on Amazon, Medicated and the Posters Wrong. Yeah, they're on YouTube now too. I put them on YouTube after that. You know, I probably should have just put them on YouTube for free when they first came out, like everybody's doing now. And I have a third special that's about to come out, and I have a feeling that's where it's going to end up on YouTube called Mullets and Mixtapes. I filmed that. It's been three and a half months since I filmed it. So, and it's still being edited. Hopefully, not by uh, the AGT editors. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I wish it was. Those guys are unbelievable <laughs> at editing, man. It was like, why? They can add some shit in and they'll add freaking applause breaks from freaking <laughs> Eddie, Eddie Murphy's comedy special and you won't be able to tell. <laughs> They're great. The beginning of the poster is wrong is funny because uh, everything on the poster is wrong. Was that inspired by a real thing? Oh, yeah. That's every gig I ever get still to this day. I can't get, I can't. Just now I was in a situation with a club I'm doing. I'm like, how many times do I have to ask you? And I'm not even being a jerk. Like, I was doing this tour, this mullets and mixtapes thing, right? It was all about the 80s. It was a uh, multimedia comedy special. I had a big screen behind me showing pictures of all this stuff from the 80s and doing stand-up about it and growing up in the 80s versus raising my kids now. So now I'm coming to some of these clubs and they'll throw the promo up saying, oh, get ready to reminisce from the, for the 80s. And they'll show like the old promo clip from Mullets and Mixtapes. And I'm like, I'm not doing It's like it's not only am I not doing it, if people saw that, they're not coming again to see that again because it was a very specific thing. Like these clubs are moving fast, man. They make mistakes with the promo all the time. So it came from that and also the that Rocky connection which I lost the love for Rocky in the last few years, which is another story in itself. But at the time when I made that special, I loved the Rocky movies. And that is a line from the first Rocky where he goes, yo, the poser's wrong. And I, you're young. I don't know if you know the moment. I'm not as young as you think I am, but go ahead. <laughs> you're younger than me. We're within uh, little brother, big brother age. You think you're like six years younger than me? Less? You're, you no, go, no, oh, I'm you look not, my age up. You're three years younger. Well, you're you in said, your 50s? You, you said your age. So, oh, I did? Yeah. Oh, all right. Or you said, you, you said the year you were born. Yes, that's oh, true. I was born I three years that. later. <laughs> oh, okay. Good math, good math. Okay. So uh, ask the question again. Uh, oh, the poster is wrong. Uh, oh, 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 that's what I was saying. The yeah. first Rocky, there's a, there's a moment in that movie, and it's probably the reason why in that special, there was a bit as if he was a comedian in that same situation where the promoter is at the empty ring. Rocky Balboa sees the poster wrong above the ring. The promoter goes, what are you doing here? And, he, and I do that impression in the special. He's got this lip. What are you doing here, Rocky? What brings you out? It's like the fucking day before the fight. <laughs> and he's in the <laughs> ring, right? He's just looking around. And uh, the pose is wrong. Goes, does, it, does it really matter, Rocky? I'm sure you'll give him a great show. Which, like, on stage, I would say, that's such a dick move. That was, like, a nice way of saying, does it matter? I mean, you're going to get your ass kicked on national television. I'm going to be a millionaire, and you're going to have brain damage. And it's very similar to comedians where like when we ask them to fix a poster, they're sitting there going, does it fucking matter, dude? No one knows who the fuck you are. Just leave the poster alone. Right. But in our head, we're like, this is all I got. Like, this is why I title my tour a name. It's the only thing left I have that makes it more fun and creative is to title the tour. <laughs> you know? I know. I think I think a comedian all we have is our name, really. Right. I mean, the reason it made me laugh so hard is I got a call once. It's a, and they're like, Jeff. I'm like, what? He's like, uh, someone stole your photo. I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, I was at this club and it was your photo, but a different name, someone else's name. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, no, no, I'm playing that club. They got my, it wasn't like they added, like sometimes Dwaskin, they'll be Dworkin or maybe like Dwa, they'll spell it phonetically or something. But it's like, this was right. like not even close, not even <laughs> close to the point so that my friend thought someone stole my photo. <laughs> He's using my photo. <laughs> just like, so I just, it made me laugh when I saw that thing. It yeah. reminded me of that. So Yeah. But at the same time, I mean, I know for a fact that I'm very meticulous and I'm obsessive compulsive, which I've realized only in the last year how bad my obsessive compulsive disorder is. But I'm not one of those germ guys like that. Germs don't bother me. I don't even care. Like 
I'm not masking when I'm going anywhere now. Like I'm just, I'm not a germ OCD guy, but when there's a flaw in something, it drives me crazy if we don't fix it. If you look on my, my uh, story of my Instagram, my wife and I, uh, my wife's mom had an old China closet that went in the corner. It was like a built in into the corner of a room and she had her whole kitchen redone. So she gave it to us. So my wife had somebody sand and paint it and install it in the corner of our living room, right? And one leg is off the ground by an inch and one leg's touching the ground, right? And I'm like, it's driving me crazy. And it was expensive to have the guy do it. And she's like, it's fine. It doesn't bother me. And I'm like, fuck, does it bother me? I'm like, <laughs> all right. She's like, just let it go. And I'm sitting there like, I'm trying to let it go. And it's like, why did that guy not, how does the guy who did the job, how does it not bother the guy who did, like if I do a job, like I tell people when they hire me sometimes for like privates, I go, I treat it like it's the Oscars. I'm like, I'm bringing my own lights. I'm going to have the, you know, the best sound system I can have for your little stupid thing, because I can't stand it. Like when I go to club sometimes and you're just standing in the dark sometimes, you know, it's just like, I can't do comedy standing in the dark. I, it's just, it makes it so much harder when I'm standing in the dark. How, why do we have to do it this way? It doesn't cost more than 50 bucks to not do it this way so um i'm with you 100 on that by the way. <laughs> i'm crazy though i but i make people annoyed man i make people mad like i'm trying to edit my comedy special right now i'm annoying the fuck out of my manager and the production company that's editing it because we filmed two shows and to me when you film two shows in the same night with the same clothes with makeup person touching you up that means you're going to pick and choose from two shows. And they're like, can you keep it minimal to just show one? We don't want to pull from show two too much. And I'm like, you're killing me because there's a lot of show two that I like. And they're like, no, it doesn't blend well. And, and, and like, that's where I get crazy because they're like, there's a guy wearing a white hat show two in the front row. I go, crop him out. I don't give a shit. Crop the guy out or leave him in. I don't even give a shit if it doesn't match. I just want me to look good. It's like, this just reminded me of that uh, movie. I love that movie, uh, uh, Almost Famous, right? Mm -hmm. You remember the guitar player is uh, Billy Crudup. And he says uh, to the, the kid who's, you know, Cameron Crowe, the kid's supposed to be Cameron Crowe. And he goes, just make me look cool. Can you just make me look cool? Like, that's all we fucking care about. Like, can I just look good? Like, why am I not allowed to pick my fucking jokes the way I want to pick it? Like, and it's all because somebody else is paying for it. Like if I was paying for it, but unfortunately I'm not, you have nothing. You, and it's so annoying. And I connect so many of these things, like why I connected that the pose was wrong. I connected to a movie. I connect the comedy business to the great Ray Liotta field of dreams, which you're, if you are my age, you've seen field of dreams. I love Field of Dreams. We used to, I had it on VHS and in college yeah. we'd be like, if you play it, she will come. We'd love it. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Well, the line that makes me think of the comedy business in that movie is where Ray Liotta, Sulis Joe Jackson, goes, What's with these lights on the field? And he goes, Oh, you know, owners decided they could make more money if they do night games also. And he goes, Owners. And he shakes his head. And I'm like, that's fucking show business. Owners. It's like they, they get in the fucking way every fucking time. And yep. then the worst is they think they know. They're, I'm like, you don't know. You don't do anything. You're not creative. You don't know. Maybe one guy in the history of this has been creative. And he probably didn't last long. You can't stay in business if you're creative. You go out of business because you made it too cool. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Owners. I like to burn every bridge in one podcast. That's what I do. <laughs> you just, you, you didn't mention any names. So you just, I didn't mean you, if it comes up. Sorry, but the owners need us to take a break. Owners, am I right? And we're back with Joe Matarese. We're going to dive into his better half. Yeah, so yeah. You, you mentioned your wife a couple of times. And while I was um, digging into the America's Got Talent stuff on their Wikipedia, <laughs> one of the credits, which I didn't find too many other places, is... Uh, a Bravo series you did with your wife called Better Half. Ooh, and where you taught your that. wife to perform stand-up comedy. This interested me because we were always we would always joke the comedians around Detroit, because our wives would always her girlfriends would always come and we were like, Oh, we need they and then they would mimic us because they'd watch us so many times. And we're like, we should do a show where they just do our material. <laughs> that would someone told me once there was a bunch of comedians that would do that as a party. 
thing they would do once a year. They'd have a big party and the wives or girlfriends would have to do their husband or boyfriend's act. And it would be really funny. And I was like, that would be hilarious to do for real. It'd be awesome. Here in New York, they do something where comedians will, for Halloween, will dress up as other comedians and do them for the shows, which is pretty funny, too. They all dress up like different comics. <laughs> they all dress up uh, as Seinfeld? What's yeah, the they, deal? <laughs> yeah, they, they all do that. <laughs> and even Jim Brewer, when he used to have a radio show on Sirius XM, used to do a show called Comedy Covers. But most of the time, you would do like an impression. It would be like, here's Andrew Dice Clay if he was doing Stephen Wright's material. You know, those would always get the biggest laughs. A little mashup, a little mashup. A mashup. Yeah, that was my first reality show and my first seeing how hard reality shows are to do. Those kind of reality shows are really hard to do when, um, because they come to your house and it's literally like they clip a mic on you and turn a camera on at eight o'clock a.m. and you're not done till 1130 at night. You're just being filmed that whole fucking day. At some point, you forget they're filming you. And then, you know, those are the shit that, <laughs> that's the shit that ends up into the show. But the only plus on that one was, is we beat the guy who we were going against and we won 20,000 bucks on that one. Whereas all the other ones didn't pay any money. America's Got Talent, Last Comic Standing, no money on those. You know what? Last Comic Standing might have paid $500. There might have been like a union minimum because it was on NBC. It, it might have. I can't remember. I did Last Comic Standing also. Which year did you do Last Comic? I did it when Ralphie May won and Rich Voss like might have came in second. Oh, so real early. I think it might have been the first one. That was yeah, another that, one. I think that was the first. That was the first season. I was working with Robert Kelly in Michigan, then happened to go to uh, New York like the week after we worked together. So I went and saw him at the Comedy Cellar. He had me sit with him, but it was that table that was based on uh, tough, uh, tough crowd. But we weren't yeah. sitting at it because you had to be like a comedy seller comedian. So I was sitting like on the edge. So Jim Norton was there and Rich Voss. And now came out, I'm like doing comedy for like a minute at the time, right? It was, I emceed for Bob Kelly. And like, so it was really cool. And so I'm sitting with these guys that I recognize. Dan Natterman, I think might've been there too, and like right. stuff like that. And so uh, Robert Kelly goes, oh yeah, yeah, Jeff and I, we worked together at the Comedy Castle uh, this past weekend. And I think it was Jim Norton that said, Oh my God, how did you get that gig? And I didn't, and it didn't even occur to me until later, like how much he was fucking with me. Right? It's like, oh my God, dude. You know, like, I'm like, uh, <laughs> and I, I remember the timing of it because I said to Rich Voss, Oh, we didn't, I, are you in the house? And he's like, like, I tell you, you know, <laughs> like, I, like, that's how dumb I am. I'm like asking him if he's, that was right around that time. So it must have been, uh, sorry, that just reminded me of it. So. No one is more brutal. Rich Voss was, was the best at, at young, like fucking with young comics. He'd always make you say a lot. And then he would just say, get me a cup of coffee. And he'd walk away. <laughs> and young comics were, they didn't know if they were like supposed to go get him the cup of coffee. <laughs> they had no idea. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, yeah. Those guys are brutal. Jim Norton shook my hand. And when he shook my hand, he, he like limped his hand. On purpose. Yeah. On purpose. And he go and then and that was so funny. And he goes, usually he goes, You're lucky. Usually I lick it first. I thought it was so funny that for a decade at like work environments and stuff like that, I would do that to other people. <laughs> we go to shake their hand and then you just say limp because the look on people's faces is like amazing. And then you tell them you're just kidding. But like that was the other thing was I went to a last comic standing audition, I think it was for the next season. It was the season where Jim Norton got in and then bailed or because he got some kind of maybe TV deal that didn't anyway. And so but Jim Norton was there and my friend Jay Chris Newberg was there and he got to like the next round. So he was filling out that those documents that you mentioned that were like your basically your life history that you have to yeah. sign off on. Like who is your person you roomed with in college and all that kind of stuff. And it was yeah. like insane, insane stuff. So, all right, so 20 grand. So your wife, does your wife kind of hold that over your head a bit? I mean, cause like, look at me, I did it one time. I win 20 grand. <laughs> no, she's so, I made her do that show. What was pretty classic was we had to audition for that show. Cause that show was, it was rare that that was like a one-off. Lots of shows that you do like that is a whole season, right? But that was just each episode what they would pick a career and either the husband and the wife would have to teach the other one how to do their career. And then they would compete against another couple where they were someone was being taught on the other in the other couple also. So they did a comedy episode and we go to the audition and we're arguing in the audition like that's like typical. My wife, I guess, sometimes 
uh, when we get in rooms and like if I have to turn it on, like I turned it on a little bit and we we're arguing, but it's not fake. It's like we're really arguing <laughs> and we leave the audition and she's like, what the, the fuck's your problem? Why would you do that? Why would you start with me in there? I go, we got it. We're going to get that show. She's like, what are you talking about? I go, they don't want a couple that's all happy and in love. That's boring. I go, we were exciting. That was hilarious. I go, they're going to love it. We're getting picked. And then we did. We got it. And this is pretty classic because the other comic was already already Fuqua. I don't know if you know who he is. He uh, he was one of the comedians who was actually in the car accident when Tracy Morgan got hit. Oh, okay. Yeah. So he had some brain damage and he got a big lawsuit, all that. But back then he didn't have any money. He wasn't married to the girl he was with. It was just his girlfriend, but she was a model. And my wife, I don't know if it hurt her feelings, but my wife has a PhD. So it was kind of like the brain versus the beauty, you know, even though my wife's attractive. But this girl was like a professional model, right? And I knew for a fact that brains is a way better thing for comedy than beauty. Beautiful people aren't funny. And Artie comes up to me after like a few rounds of the show and a few days of taping. He goes, because the loser got five grand and the winner got 20. He goes, let's just make a deal outside of this show that we split it. 50 50 and we each get 12 5 and we don't have to like stress and i go that would have made sense if i didn't just see the the big final round he said it after the final <laughs> round and my wife killed and his girlfriend was dirty and didn't do good i'm like why is she dirty on television that's not gonna fly on nbc or that was bravo it's not gonna fly on television what, what is she doing i go i'm gonna I'm going for it all, dude. I'm going to take the risk because my wife did way better. I go, even though I know these contests are never fair. That was the only thing in my head. I'm like, they're never fair. And then that was the one time they were fucking fair and we won the 20 grand. Oh, my God. And my, Like I said, my wife so didn't want to do it. And boy, do they, they, they pretty much fuck up your house when they do those shows. You think they're being careful when they're bringing their gear in and out? They're scratching your floors. They don't fucking care. Oh, my God. Did your wife ever want to do stand up again? No, my wife hates. She doesn't even let me film her for social media. She's like, get the camera off me. I'm like, <laughs> I've known for like years that if she would be involved in my career, because we're at a time where I say comedians can't be alone. Like there needs to be some sort of their life has to be shown. The behind the scenes of them is important to them making it. And my wife won't let me do any of the behind the scenes. I go, you're killing it here. Because this is what I talk about on stage is you and this you being intelligent and me struggling to get out of high school, the whole thing. And like, no one can really see it in, in its form. I heard Seinfeld somewhere and I showed it to her. Seinfeld said, if you're related to a comedian, you're in the family business. Sorry. Like, we're going to talk about you on stage and you're involved. It's just the way it works. But no, she hates it. She hates the comedy business too. Like she, anything, any time something has an almost, it's going to be big. She just goes, she doesn't get excited at all. She's just waiting for it to fall out because it always falls out. She's like, this business sucks. I don't even want to hear anything anymore. Just leave me out of it. <laughs> <laughs> hates podcasting too. She's like, I hate when you podcast because that's when, that's when you always blurt out truth about your life because you, you don't have time to think. She's like, I hate it. Why'd you say that? Right now, I'm probably in trouble right now. <laughs> She's listening. She's like, well, speaking of podcasting, you've had like a thousand different podcasts. <laughs> I know. You're uh, you're really into the uh, creative, uh, making all the different, the Joe, Ma the Joe Matarese, uh medicated podcast, stand up, lie down, fixing Joe podcast. What's going on this week? A lot. Oh, pretender to contender. So you got, you got, yeah. you got a lot going on. I mean, not, Some these are all, not all live at the same time, but. No, and I don't have, I don't have one now and I haven't had. I'd, like, I'd be interested to know how long it's been since Pretender to Contender went off the air. June 2022. 2022 was the last one? June, I think, yeah. Okay. You had 66 episodes. I mean, that was you had a lot. I mean, that's that's deep in. I mean, that's... Well, I always say none of... Probably only... There's only one or two that were really short. Like, Stand Up Lie Down was just one season. We did a season of them with a bunch of comedians. That was where I had a, a celebrity shrink interview comedians with me and we pulled clips of their act that matched up with their neuroses and then that one was about to be pitched and they were going to spend 10 grand on the pilot to shoot that idea 
And then the celebrity doctor that I had that I who was connected to the project had a lawsuit <laughs> come oh, up God. where he was being sued for patients for sexual harassment. And then they just said, we can't do the idea now. And I go, we'll just use a different doctor. They were like, no, we're done. And they just bailed. I was like, OK, lost that one. That one was a pretty good idea, but wasn't fun. If I ever do a podcast again, it won't be in. A, I've always had these locked in specific ideas like fixing Joe. That was where I talk about my problems and I had audience like listeners leave messages because I couldn't do live phone calls where they would give me advice on whatever my problems were. I did that one for six straight years. And that was probably the most successful podcast I ever had. That was my first one. Well, that was a web series also. It was a web series. Someone funded that web series. So I made some money there. And then uh, it sold as an another TV show another time to a different production company, but that never got made. That's probably the reason why I think of these concept ideas, because I used to really enjoy pitching TV shows and I had some success in it. But it's ultimately, if you don't have a following, nobody's buying your shows anymore. Back then, you could sell an idea. Nobody's buying an idea anymore. You better have a million Instagram followers or they're not interested. Next podcast will just be the Joe Mattery show and I'll just talk. Just do your thing. Just do your Joe Mattery yeah, stuff. Do you always just talk to one comic at the, or is there just anybody you interview? I'll take anyone. No, I'm just kidding. The, uh... <laughs> just stand-ups? No, no. I talk to, uh, to stand-ups because that's interesting to me because of doing stand-up. Mm -hmm. for as long as I did. But then I also, I talked to a lot of like TV film actors and a lot of them from, you might be too young to know some of these people. Ah, who's your biggest old school one that I know? Ed Asner. Ed Asner. Yeah. A friend of mine had him on his, didn't he pass away recently? He passed away. Um, I had Judy Tenu. Oh, Judy Tenu is a comedian. I had. She passed uh, away too. She passed away too. Yeah. Ronnie Cox. Ronnie, you would know Ronnie. Ronnie Cox is like the greatest actor that nobody knows by name. But if I showed you his face, he was um, the bad guy in um, what's uh, uh, Arnie Schwarzenegger when he goes to Mars. He was also in RoboCop, bad guy in RoboCop. Oh, right? yeah, that guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. That guy. he looks like a robot. Yeah, Ed Beckley Jr. Oh, Sharon Glass, Cagney and Lacey. A lot of folks. Uh, oh, uh, Isaac Gopher and Doc, the love boat. You know, so. All of them at the same time? Not at the same time. But, uh, uh, that would have been amazing. Yeah. Ralph Mouth and uh, Potsy and Mrs. Cunningham. So, you know. Out of, out of the old school actors, who gets the most downloads on a podcast? That's a great one. Now I'm interviewing you. Now you're interviewing me. Um, you know, I'd have to check, but I guess, you know who gets the most? I can, I could be like going, talking to somebody and they'd be like, who's been on your podcast? I'm like, oh, Angela Cartwright, you know, Penny from Lost in Space and Ed Asner and Sharon Glass and this and this and this. And they're just looking at me kind of, you know, glass eyed. Don't know and, I go, any of them. and I go, uh, Carol Baskin. You interviewed Carol Baskin, dude. I'm like, yeah, I interviewed Carol Baskin. I can see where that, she's a wonderful woman, but I can see where that would be more impressive than, say, Ed Asner. <laughs> like, I even, and know. I don't even know who Carol Baskin oh, it's, you know, is. Tiger King, Tiger King. Oh, I hated Tiger. I didn't even watch that whole thing. Can oh, you yeah. It? She's a. Uh, it's that woman? Big cat. Yeah, the, the woman. The one, you know, you, you would know that everyone thinks killed her husband, <laughs> stuff like yeah. that. It was yeah. uh, a big thing. So, uh, Ralph Mouth. Donnie Most. Yeah, he was he was good. Because at the end, an I got him to say, even on the Jeff Dwoskin show, I still got it. <laughs> did you have Robert Romanus on? No. He will he did my old podcast. You just ask him, he'll do it. You got to have Damone on. Guy's classic. He let me come to his house and interview him in his living room. Oh, really? I love when like guys are really open like that. He's like, yeah, come on over. You can interview me here. <laughs> That's I awesome. interviewed him in his kitchen. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. That is really cool. Well, Joe, thank you so much for hanging with me. This was fun. It was good to get to know you. Where can people keep up with you on the social medias? Follow me anywhere at, at the Joe Matteris. That's uh that's pretty much all of them. Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. They're all the Joe Matteris and my website's JoeMatteris.com. Put all the links in the show notes so people can uh, follow you and get as much Joe Matteris as possible <laughs> into their lives. Thanks for having me on, Jeff. All right, everyone, how fun was Joe Matarese? So many great stories, insights. Thank you, Joe, for sharing so much with us. Well, with the interview over, it can only mean one thing. I know, the episode is over. How do they come and go so quick? Huge thank you to Joe Matarese one more time for hanging with me. And a huge thank you to all of you for coming back week after week. It means the world to me, and I'll see you next time so much for listening to this episode of Classic Conversations. 
If you like what you heard, don't be shy and give us a follow on your favorite podcast app. Also, why not go ahead and tell all your friends about the show? You strike us as the kind of person that people listen to. Thanks in advance for spreading the word, and we'll catch you next time on Classic Conversations.